<laughs> Good. Uh, I'm Alex Graf, I work at SUSE. Um, I've been here at Embedded Recipes and right now at Kernel Recipes, which uh, are amazing events in France. Uh, at Embedded Recipes, I gave a presentation on uh, how to boot UEFI payloads using uBoot. So it's a new development that's happening uh, for the last two years already, where in uBoot, which is a booting framework for embedded systems, uh, you can run UEFI payloads, for example, GRA, which allows distributions to just go and boot using uh, a stock firmware that just happens to work on all the devices you have out there. So if you want to run an operating system, it's not an individual image per device, but instead you can just run the same, same distribution everywhere, which is what people are used to on PCs, but it's completely unknown of in the embedded world. Um, we gave a presentation on that one uh, that included also EBBR, which is a spec we're working on right now uh, to manifest boot flows for embedded system and embedded people so that when you get a device in your hands, you can get a stamp from your supplier saying this is EBBR compliant and you know things just work. Yes. Uh, now at Kernel Recipes, I'll give a presentation on, again, UEFI. I'm becoming the new UEFI guy over here. Uh, where I'm emulating Intel option ROMs on ARM servers. So, in a nutshell, if you plug in a graphics card into an ARM server without this, it will not display anything while you boot. With this, it will execute the Intel code that's on the graphics card itself on your ARM system and you can actually see an image while you're booting up and just leverage any PCI card within your firmware. Uh, Paul was talking earlier about some of the KVM changes and nested the virtualization and talking about how you were too early with some of your code and some of that needs to be rewritten. And it was too. great when it was at the time, but now things have changed a little bit and he, was, he mentioned you, so maybe you want to say something about that? So it wasn't, it wasn't too early, it was actually the right point in time. Uh, so it was, it was eight years ago. And people did not think of nesting at all. It was this, this obscure feature that they believed nobody would need. And I did see a, a slight need for it. It was really more of a technical challenge to be solved. But I did see a slight need for it. And it turned out that uh, just a few years later, our cloud developers actually made heavy use of this because you don't want to buy 10 servers just to test whether your current cloud deployment still works. You don't want to deploy 10 bare metal servers just to test it. You want to do all of that on virtual machines. So uh, what uh, nesting actually enabled us was to change the industry. Uh, what happened later on, thanks to the code that I wrote eight years ago, uh, we now have extensions in current CPUs that make nesting much easier than it would ever have been without this. So this really was just more of a kick towards the industry to show them like, look, this is something you should probably work on. And it worked out. So now we have working nesting even on Intel and the support that I have from back then was on AMD and that looks pretty much sim similar to what it was initially which was not the best type of code I guess um, and in hindsight you obviously know way more things than you ever did back in the day uh, so some things will need to be improved in that code but it doesn't mean it was bad it means it just means it was uh, I, I did obviously did not spend the last eight years to maintain that code <laughs> It was it was still great code um, back when it started, and it can still run Linux on Linux just fine. You can run a couple of hypervisors on it. Yeah. So it's our our cloud guys actually use that in production these days, or not not in production production, but in production development where they see eyeing our cloud infrastructure. So that that still is great. Apart from that, on on the KVM side, I'm uh, I've been doing way less KVM work the last couple of years than I've been uh, before. So it's. Basically, all of the low-level ARM firmware things just eat up my time and I don't get around to do as much QMU and KVM things as I like to. I still do a couple of hacks here and there from time to time, like the emulation piece I was talking about, that one actually leverages QMU inside of firmware, uh, which is pretty cool. I have other toy projects I'm working on, like an SD emulator that is halfway written in HDL, so in, in hardware description. Uh, so it's running on FPGA and the other half is actually QMU code again. Uh, so I, I still do like the project, I still stick around, but I'm not uh, one of the core developers anymore, so I don't know all the current developments that are going on. Are the projects in good hands? The project's in really good hands. I mean, the, the main reason I, I, I'm i not as involved is because they just don't need me, right? They, they get along just fine. I mean, all, all of the things I kicked off, all the KVM power support works just fine, it's maintained perfectly well now. 
um, all of the uh, SD90 support that I uh, really helped a lot on back then is in really, really good hands. Uh, it, it, everything just keeps on without me, so I, I don't need to uh, babysit it. I, I mean, after a while, you need to let your children go and develop their own life, right?